to you. Very much. Yeah, um, I actually have a slide back that covers a bit more than just charges. Uh, talking about uh, what's happening in the market, and we are talking about the National Construction Code that uh, has changed. I'm not sure if you're aware, I'll cover some. Uh, talking about uh, the key uh, point to make these things work in, in buildings that are already uh, there, uh, people called ground sites, uh, not the new buildings, but the existing ones, uh, load management systems. Um, uh, cover a little bit of the new technology, what's uh, what's available now in the market from Schneider. Um, what else? I think that's yeah, that's about it. Uh, so probably 40 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on you know hands coming up. And um, uh, people sometimes don't know the brand or you're not close to this uh, to Schneider Electric. Uh, do you have you heard about Schneider Electric before? No. Yes. Schneider is um, is a multinational company based in France. So it's a French company, although the name sounds German. It's a, it's a French company, uh, multinational. So we have a branch here in, in, in Australia, of course, the headquarters is in Sydney. Uh, we have a um, sales office here in Notting Hill. So not far, that's where I'm based. Um, and my role is, like this one forward. My role is um, immobility business development manager slash solution architect. So I kind of wear a couple of hats. Um, I'm an electrical engineer. So I do the technical stuff, the technical bit. And I also do some of the commercial bit in terms of putting solutions together uh, for large projects. That's what usually comes my way. When I say large projects, uh, high rises, airports, shopping centers, everything with like a 50 more charges, uh, full measurement system, the whole infrastructure. Schneider can cover pretty much everything. We don't just make charges, okay? Uh, we make transformers, distribution boards, switch gear, Everything cascading down all the way to the charger on the wall. Everything, including the smart the load management system, is by all Schneider. Um, so we just don't make cars. Okay. Uh, later on, I'll show you a little bit of these two charges over here. So, as, as was said before, it's good timing to be uh, talking about this. Uh, we just refreshed our offer on EV charges. Believe it or not, we've been in the market for 10 years already. I actually Googled the manual of the previous family of charges, it's dated 2013, the original manual. Um, and we launched the new version, the new family uh, early this year uh, for uh, domestic uh, single family homes, the uh, EVLink home, and the commercial applications, the EVLink for AC. Uh, this one got launched in Australia two months ago. Okay, we were the third wave, unfortunately. Uh, it's been launched first, first in Europe and then uh, US. Finally, in Australia, very exciting times. Uh, anyway, this presentation covers a little bit of everything. It is a little bit of trends to explain why this is happening in my lifetime. Um, so the first thing we, we talk about it to, to everyone that listens to this, you know, consultants, contractors, customers, is a little bit of what's going on in the world. Um, people think, why, why we are moving uh, to electrify, you know, transportation? Well, transportation, is actually one third of the problem when you talk about the greenhouse gas emissions. So you talk about global warming, every time you turn the TV on the news, there is always five minutes there about you know, global warming. One third of the problem, transportation. The other two thirds, if you're interested, um, industry and uh, um, buildings. So if you can make buildings more efficient, if you can make uh, industry more efficient, you're helping. If you can move away from internal combustion vehicles and move to electric vehicles, we are tackling one third of the problem. So no wonder there's a lot of eyes on moving away from internal combustion vehicles. Uh, this is a trend in Australia, okay? So this is not global, this is here. Uh, the orange curve going up is the sales of EVs, is the projection of sales of EVs in Australia. The brown curve coming down is the sales of internal combustion vehicles. Uh, this is us today, and this is us 12 years from now. So 12 years is not that far, okay? Uh, the projection is that by this time, 2035, 36, we're gonna be selling more EVs than we actually sell internal combustion vehicles in this country, okay? Some say it's gonna come earlier. Mm -hmm. That point will actually happen before, but this is just a projection. It's not our numbers. We just researched and we got into those results. So typically I say there are three things on the way for us to buy an EV. The first thing is typically cost. It's not in my budget, 
But as we know, market or, or technology tends to come down. So the joke is like 20 years ago, you buy a flat screen like this one and you take on a mortgage. And now you can go to JB Hi-Fi with a couple of thousand dollars and you get one bigger than this. Um, so prices coming down, you have brands like a BYD pushing the prices down less than 50K on AEV. The second point is range. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, you're gonna buy an EV, 200K to 50K range. Now you can get Tesla's doing 600K. So again, technology is bringing the range up. So second tick. The third tick is when we come in, infrastructure to charge. You buy an EV, where are you gonna charge this car? If I move away from home, that's where my charge point is. Then I charge someplace else and then drive back home. That's where Schneider comes in. Okay, um, just to put in perspective, this year we are aiming to double the number of chargers we sold last year. And that's roughly, we're, gonna, we're on track to sell about 3,000 chargers in Australia just in 2023. So that's double to what we sold last year. So it's doubling up. Okay. Uh, let's see, next one. And the other thing that is uh, kind of a myth, uh, we try to explain to everyone uh, because we always um, had these petrol you know, hats uh, with us. We think that we're gonna drive an EV and wait for the battery to come to 2% and then find a fast charge station somewhere. And that's not how it works. That's again, the petrol head talking. Uh, that particular behavior will happen in transit. When you actually drive from here to Sydney and you have to stop. <laughs> And you have to stop maybe a couple of times on the way to Sydney to fast charge your battery. And those super fast charge stations on the freeway, they represent about 3% only of the charging ecosystem. So most, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to, yeah, right? most of the times you need to, you're gonna see charging happening at homes, residential buildings and commercial buildings. So your car is charging at home to work, you come to work to the office, what you do? You plug, you leave home, you leave office, you go to see a customer, you plug, you go to the shopping center, you plug. So everywhere you go, you plug your car. So you're always topping up. You come back home, you're probably at 90%, you just finish your topping up overnight. So that's how it works. You don't wait until the battery comes to 2%. Uh, Schneider actually works on this 70, uh, sorry, 97% ecosystem. Today, we don't have any DC charges. We don't sell DC charges. We sell AC charges. And you're probably gonna find the previous ones uh, everywhere you go, um, Coles, they have a standard on middle link parking. Uh, they typically wrap in red, but it's kind of a square shape. Um, you have a lot of other companies that have standards, La Trobe University have a standard on middle links as well. So lots of companies out there. Uh, but as I said, we are moving away uh, from the original middle link parking to the middle link for AC. I'm gonna show some pictures of this new charger. <laughs> Uh, and then comes the, the interesting point over here, the National Construction Code. I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, this regulates how we put these buildings together in Australia. So to get a certificate of occupancy, they have to tick some boxes. Do you have smoke alarms? Are you complying with the you know, four or five rating energy saving uh, type of uh, uh, regulation? And until last year, there was zero, zero, uh, um, guidelines for electrical vehicle charging for any building in Australia. You can build an airport, a shopping center, I'm not talk about houses, houses is easy, you can put a charger there anytime, but you put a high rise with 150 car park, car spots over there, zero EV charge infrastructure. Down the track, you try to retrofit, it costs a lot of money. So the Electrical Vehicle Council of Australia put a lot of inputs into the NCC and the NCC gets revised every three years. So 2022 was a year for a revision. They took that on board. They accepted the, the inputs from the, national, from the EV council. And then what that resulted on is this. Uh, for class buildings, two, which is apartment buildings, hotels, office buildings like this one, shopping centers, warehouses, factories, hospitals, schools, universities. All these class buildings highlighted in green are now a concern of the NCC. It is effective from May this year, last, last month or two months ago, 
and mandatory from October, they need to comply with the new NCC. So what is the new NCC? There is a new section called J94, and this is a copy from the, the NCC itself. I highlighted a few things. Those class buildings we mentioned before must be provided with a dedicated distribution boards. Cannot be shared with any load, other loads in the building, okay? Unless the building has less than 10 car spots. If it's up to nine car spots, you can just share with the main distribution board and have feeders for the charges. If it is 10 or more, you need to start putting dedicated distribution boards with all the circuit breakers for the charges in the garage. And there is a table over there, J9D4, that says up to 24 car spots, one board, then start a new board. We asked the question, we went back to the, to the EV console, why? You don't wanna see like a, a dodgy, large, gigantic board with 150 circuits trying to find charges everywhere in the garage. So every 24 car space is one board. Okay. Unnecessary to say, we already flooded with inquiries from consultants, contractors. How do I meet this? Schneider already created a distribution border to meet the NCC. How many do you need? And it's now part number. Okay. Yes. Do those boards have to be distributed around the, the car park or can they all be in one spot? It's a decision of the consultant, the contractor, when they design the system. From my experience, from what I see, it's scattered across the car park in different levels and so on. The question as well that these, uh, I guess, this code does that apply to uh, existing buildings that are doing a retrofit as well? Uh, um, is that board? It depends on the retrofit. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly the the, uh, the threshold, but let's say if you turn down half of the building and you rebuild it, you're going to have to tick the box of the NCC. But if the renovation is minor, you don't. Okay. And if it's an existing building, you can put whatever you want. You don't, you don't have to comply with I'm going to tell you in a second. And what, what Australian standards is that covered by? Uh, the electrical part? No, this, this, this uh, NCC 2022, that would obviously come under an Australian standard, would it not? Uh, it's a building code. It's a building code. Yeah, it's not a, 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 not a, what, not yeah, a standard as such. No. The standards in such would be standards for electrical standards or building standards, but that, that's the bare minimum to get the certificate of occupancy in a building. Is this a national thing? Or, or it's a national thing, national construction. Even New South Wales, where the buildings fall down, have to comply with that? Everywhere. It used to be called an old BCA. So I'm, I'm getting inquiries from all buildings coming up in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. Um, South Australia, not much happened in Perth so far, but they need to comply. Okay. Um, so the, the distribution boards must be dedicated for EV charging, must be labeled to indicate you no know, exclusive uh, use for EV charging uh, equipment. It must have load management system. So that's the, 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 the key point. It's not about finding more power, it's about using the power when it's available across the day. I'll explain how that works in a sec, okay? Because everyone think about, shoo, I'm gonna have to put all these charges, I need another transformer, I need another main board. No, you don't. Uh, and then come some interesting numbers there. So the NCC says that on a class two building, apartment building, the system must be able to deliver 12 kilowatt hours between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. daily. Bare minimum requirement, why is that? Even if you switch off the charges from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., you tick the box of the NCC. But what's about that 12 kilowatt hours? You guys drive EVs, 12 kilowatt hours equates to about what, 60 kilometers range, average commuting distance to get to work. So the NCC is concerned about me getting home, plugging my car next morning, I get up, I should have 60K range in my car to drive to work, at least. Anything over that? Bonus. I go to work, class five buildings, office buildings. I plug my car. By 5 p.m., I should have 12 kilowatt hours in the battery. I can drive back home. Just that. Okay, very simple. If it's a hotel, a bit different there. Class three building, 48 kilowatt hours delivered between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Why? 
I drive from here to Shepparton, I stay in a hotel, I hope I have a battery fully charged for driving back to Melbourne next day. 48 kilowatt hours, 250, 300 days. <laughs> okay, so a hotel needs to comply with that. And uh, the system must be able to support the installation of at least seven kilowatt single phase charger, at least. Nothing below that, anything above or this? Yes? Obviously, we have the load management that's about 15 amps, which doesn't really require a dedicated EBSC. But that would. That, yes, 12 kilowatt hours across eight hours is about 6.5 amps. It's less than a GPO. Well, yeah, that would be 15 amps. Five? Amps. Five. You may not have even 6.5 amps during the day. That's when the load management system will throttle down those charges and even switch off the charging if the building's consuming a lot of power. But between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., what happens? Very little consumption. You're not cooking, you're not using the lifts, you're not doing much. You have enough power to then deploy to the EVs. That's when it gets scary. If it's a class two building, apartment building, 100% of the car spaces on that building must have the provisions for the EV charge equipment. Provision. It doesn't have to have the charger on the wall, but distribution board, the load management system, cable tray, everything must be there. So if I buy an EV and that's my car spot, I pay a couple of thousand dollars, put a charger in there, the electrician will just connect, everything else is done on the board. If it is a office building, 10% of the car spaces with uh, chargers. If it is a hotel, 20% of the car spaces with chargers. So that's what the NCC is asking to, to be compliant, okay? So it is, it is a big deal. We're gonna see a big change on new buildings coming up from October this year onwards. And uh, guess what? A lot of brown sites, I call brown sites existing buildings, they are trying to catch up because they're seeing a difference in real estate value now. People don't want to buy on the brown side because I'm going to buy an EV in future. I can't get a charger on that building. I'm going to buy what? A new building. So existing buildings are coming to us and say, I need those boards. I need to retrofit. I need to add a management system and I cannot touch on my transformer. So how can I make a discharge new cars? And uh, I'm going to explain in a second how, how it works. Cool. Uh, also, the mitigating fire uh, risk or it comes to us. And we typically tell a lot of people, we need to be sure we're talking about the right subject. Are you talking about cars catching on fire or electrical distribution boards catching on fire? Because we make electrical distribution boards, we make charges. But what about this thing? This thing doesn't dissipate heat. There's, there is no moving parts in there. There's a compactor. It closes when it's charging, opens when it's not charging. Sometimes we make a joke, it's a glorified power point, okay? It's not a charger per se. We call chargers, but it doesn't do what those fast chargers do on the freeway. Those convert AC into DC and pump a lot of energy on the car. They dissipate the heat. They have moving parts, fans, things. That's why they're never underground. They're always exposed areas because those things can actually heat up. And the cars that are charging from those can actually have more stress on the battery because there is a lot of energy flowing very quick. This. It's a trickle charge, up to 22 kilowatts, 32 amps, okay? So statistically speaking, and that's when it's very cool, there is a high chance of your petrol car catching on fire on the petrol pump than actually an EV catching on fire on a car park in an apartment building. And what they're asking us to do, I mean, the fire regulators is whoever provides the distribution boards, the infrastructure for charging the EVs, provide a way to shunt trip the board in case of fire. So you, you interlock the board with the fire alarms, you interlock the board with emergency buttons across the car park. Something's happening, there is smoke over there. You shunt trip the board, the normal power for the EVs. The rest is the fire brigade, the fire systems, whatever, sprinklers, whatever is gonna work there. We can answer for more because we don't make cars, okay? Now, as I mentioned before, Schneider is about the whole infrastructure. So we say the charger on the wall is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, for every dollar you put on the charger, there is an equivalent dollar on the infrastructure that is gonna power that charger. So that's uh, switch gear, 
<coughs> meter, energy meters, load management systems, um, everything to do with powering up, you know, that charger. That's sort of the, the ratio on the, on the cost, on the investment of uh, charging an EV. Um, as of last May, we launched the new EVLink Pro AC uh, from seven kilowatts uh, single phase all the way to 22 kilowatts three phase. We call the mode three charging. The easiest way to explain how it works. Um, I always say, pick your charger. Do you want to, with an attached cable or socket? You know the difference. You know, like the cables sometimes are convenient, but sometimes they are a problem. A tripping hazard, people don't look after cables, especially in a uh, public space. Cars run over cables that are on the ground. You have to replace cables. So if it's a public space, socket is a typical choice. If it is a residential, like my charger, my garage, cable. So pick your charger, then pick the size. I want a seven kilowatt single phase. I want a 22 kilowatts three phase. And then decide how you're gonna install the charger. So the charger itself is IP55. So it can be outside uh, exposed to the weather. So these chargers can be exposed to the weather. But sometimes you ask the question, where are you gonna mount it? What do you mean? Do you have a wall? I don't have a wall, it's an open car park. So let's talk about accessories. We can provide the mounting poles for a single charger or two chargers back to back. Oh, hang on, this is going to a public space. I'm concerned about impact, vandalism. We can wrap that charger in a metallic enclosure, 2.5 mil steel thick, galvanized, powder coated. And uh, depending on the user, um, La Trobe University calls, they can wrap the whole charger in their colors and their you know, logos. So we provide all the drawings for the graphic designers to wrap the chargers any way they want. So simple as that. So these are the, the chargers. So these are some examples of the EVLink already in Australia. So we launched this in May. We're already getting some pictures of the installations done in Australia. The first one over there is a hospital in Queensland. Um, it's about 45 chargers already there. Uh, this one here is a rental car company. So you can see the same shed inside and, and out. So they can charge the Teslas for the, the rental company outside. So these are the, the Pro ECs they're charging with cable attached uh, and inside of the, the installation as well. And this is the evening Pro EC with the metal enclosure on the public uh, street over there. Some of the features that are interesting to show on the charger that I like, uh, the green arch or the, the LED arch on the top. You can see from a distance if the charger is available. Showing green means nothing's connected to the charger, so you can come and plug your car. Uh, I was going to mention something else, but um, this card is not authorized. So we can have RFID readers on the charger, and you can be the owner of a car that unlocks the charger. So if this sits in a garage in an apartment building, the neighbor is not going to pinch power from your charger. You need to unlock with your own badge. So you bring your own badge. Charger is happy. The car talks to the charger. It's connected to the car, it switched to blue. It's plugged. The car agrees with the charger on the charging rate. The contactor closes and it starts to oscillate the loop and it's charged. Okay. When the car says, I'm done, I'm full, I want to uh, stop charging, the contactor drops, goes fully, fully blue again, but it's still connected. The car drives away, goes back to green. There is a problem, there is a fault, something happened. Charger goes red. So you can see from a distance what's going on with the charge station. Safety for Schneider is uh, Aramon. What happens if this contactor inside the charger, jams closed, welds closed? Okay, this is a circuit that is opening and closing all the time. It is an industrial contactor, mind you. Some chargers out there, they're quite tiny. They don't have a contactor, they have a relay. This is an industrial contactor, but even so, there is a chance of that contactor, you know, sticking closed. You want plug, you drive away. That socket is live with potentially 400 volts. Could be an attached cable on the ground on a rainy day, and that could be 400 volts on that cable. The Pro-EC charger will monitor the starts of the contactor. If that contactor doesn't open when it's supposed to open, we're gonna shunt trip the charger, killing power for the charger, nothing comes out of the, the socket. That's a major problem. We need to call a technician, we need to replace the contactor. 
but we have that extra layer of safety. Communication, so it talks to the load management system, it talks to charge point operators like you know, Everty, ChargeFox. So communication is there, it's open. Um, what else? I'm trying to think here. The protections built into the charger, you just need a typical RCD or RCBO on the board. You don't need anything special anymore. The rest I already mentioned to you guys. So socket, cable, things like that. So that's the charger inside. So as we say, it's a glorified PowerPoint, okay? Cables come in, go through the, uh, to the protection devices, meet the board, back into the contactor, to the socket. And the rest are the smarts talking to other systems. Any questions? Okay. So you're saying you don't want to just a standard, with the standard house one, I don't need to install a three-phase RCD because the unit's got an RCD in it. I'll explain that a bit better. Uh, in the past, uh, when I say past 10 years ago, yeah. chargers didn't have DC protection built in. So they had no protection at all. Cars can, re can uh, release AC residual current and DC residual current because of the DC battery. So what you need on the board is a special type of B RCD, which is much, much more expensive and large. <laughs> with the new technology, and I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, we are catching up because our previous chargers needed a type B RCD. Now with these new chargers, we don't need the type B. We can only use a type A or RCBO, okay? The DC part of the protection is inside the chargers. And uh, perhaps the question could be, what if the charger recognizes six milliamps DC coming from the car and trips? How do I reset that? Don't plug the charger cable, plug it back into the charger that resets that. You don't have to power down the charger, you don't have to do anything on the board. You just unplug the car from the charger, it resets the, the protection. But if it, if it is an AC uh, trip, that's gonna happen on the board. Okay? In a lot of instances, having a DC charger at home or a three-phase charger yes. is a bit of an overkill. Oh, a DC charger, I understood to see one in a home. Well, I'm, I'm just saying. You, you, need, a, you need a lot of power for that. Uh, even a 22 kilowatts can be an overkill because as we know, unless you drive a, a Porsche. Well, my, my missus have been driving a, been driving a car now for eight, 18 months. And we, we've got a granny, what we call a granny charger. Yep. Three pin plug. Yep. 15 amp, plug it in the wall, yep. plug it in the car, yep. and the amount of comments she does a day is enough. I, I could go on a bicycle, and I'm, and I'm not very fit. It's enough. But, uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't need the charger you don't if your it. style of living is about driving to the shopping center and back. But well, if, well, I drive, if I drive to Geelong and back, and next day I need to go to Bendigo, I can't charge from a 15 amp power plant. No, I agree with that. That's so, it. You know, so it depends on your style of living yeah. where you go and next day. How much, how much time do you think you need from a 15 hour power point? Because we've got a model three. Three point, it'll give you 3.6 kilowatts. Yeah, divide really that into, if you're fully empty, divide that into your battery capacity. So, yeah. so if we're, we're charging it completely overnight. I mean, it'll take 12 hours. Yeah, but, yeah. but you're, up, you're in better sleep. It's all, it's all about the divide, as you yeah. said, divided the size of the battery by the kilowatts available. So a 10 amp power point is about 2.3 kilowatts, 15 amp will be more. 3.6. 3.6. Yeah. So you divide a 60 kilowatt hour battery by 3.6 and you get your hours, yeah. which is quite a bit. Yeah, but that's if you have a, you're empty. Yeah. And if you have a, a 7 kilowatt single phase charger, 7 kilowatts is twice. Yeah. It's fast. Yeah, the thing is, see, where I can get, get carried away is the fact that they say, oh, you know, charging, charging, charging. Mm -hmm. But Kat, she charges her car and she, she's on a charge. What, what are you using, Kat, with the BMW? Well, we've got Brendan. 30 amp glorified power plug. You've got a granny charger, haven't you? We've got, we've got a four charger. What, seven amp? Uh, 32 amp. 30 seven amp, seven kilowatts. Like seven kilowatts. So, so 32 amps is this. This is a seven kilowatt charge, yeah. single phase. So what, Not everyone what, what, needs what I'm trying to get to you at is a case of it is that you know for a, a granny charge which comes with most vehicles, yep. right? Um, even if you was to buy one aftermarket, you're, you're paying 260 bucks for it. Mm -hmm. there with that <laughs> me. But um, you know that gives you that availability to charge your car that's, at home, that's fine right? For home. Provided you've got a driveway. That's fine. If, for if, home. You, haven't, if you haven't got a driveway, yeah. you've got a bit of a problem. Yeah. 
The issue is when you try to approach an apartment building. Yeah, yeah totally. That's right. I mean, it all depends what you need it for and what you're doing. That's so right. You're totally right. We, we yeah, have another privilege. We have a driveway. Yeah. 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 It, it takes four hours. Yeah. For the little BMW I three to charge, fourteen hours at my mum's house. If you know, just on a ten hour. Yeah. Um, yeah. When was the last when, when was the last time you drove your car to had nothing left? Oh, no, because I'm, I'm, I'm still got range anxiety from the other leaf So I, I'm very I'm very conservative. I don't want to go to a 30% battery on the i3. Well, I get, I get to about 30% state of charge. I go, this is good charge. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. yeah. The, the issue yeah, I'm plug it in this yeah. morning. No. People need options. That's the thing. That's right. Yeah. Now remember, the NCC is not about the homes, single family homes. You don't have choice. You do whatever you want in your single family home. On an apartment building, is a different story. Yeah. Because if you say, give me a 15 amp PowerPoint here, because that's the only thing I need, you and another 100 people want a 15 amp PowerPoint. The, the worst case scenario is, 50 people will plug EVs at the same time overnight, drawing 50 names each. Yeah. That's enough to, for the building to trip the main breaker. So what's happening is the load management system will throttle even down, further down those 50 names. But we cannot do that without a charger. A PowerPoint cannot be throttled down. A charger can. And that's when it comes yeah. essential for the building. By the way, I will talk about uh, load management system for a home. As well, not just buildings. Um, all right, guys. Uh, this is about configuring the charger, not for <laughs> domestic use. This is for the installer to configure the charger. I'm not going to spend much time, but this is the part I want to talk to you guys. This is load management systems. Okay, uh, it can happen in different ways. Some will offer it as a cloud-based system, like it's not part of the building. For Schneider, it sits on site. Okay, it's an edge control, it's an industrial PC. So that little box is the size of a power supply. Uh, it takes up to 50 degrees Celsius, so it can be mounted inside the distribution board out in the sun. What it does, let's just skip that one. So that's, that's an example of the load management system in a distribution board in a building. Uh, power supply feeding the, the load management system. There is an ethernet switch, and these are the circuits going for each charger on the building. Uh, the easiest way to explain how this plays. Imagine that I have a static load management system. This is the consumption in the building in green, okay? So this is your building consuming power across 24 hours. This is likely to be 6 p.m. when everyone is home. And this is likely to be 3 a.m. when everyone is sleeping, okay? Let's say the gap in between the subscribed power and the consumption is this orange area is 100 amps. We can play on a static mode and tell the LMS, hey, we only have 100 amps to work across 24 hours. How many charges can I have? As many as you want. The LMS will play with the charges not to go beyond 100 amps. So to give an example, car number one, number two, number three, that's 32, 32, 32 amps, that's close to 100 amps already. Comes car number four, I don't have 32 amps, but I'm gonna dilute 100 amps into 25, 25, 25, I'm gonna get 100 amps in four cars. Comes car number five, 20 amps each. Comes car number six, 15 amps each, and so on and so on and so on. To the bare minimum of six amps per car, six amps. Cars don't take less than six amps. And then I already have a pool of cars there drawing six amps each. And then, comes another car and I don't have six amps to give to that new car. The LMS will actually start load shedding. The car that is the oldest in the rank or the one that received the largest uh, amount of energy will be suspended. So I can give six amps to the newest car. 15 minutes later, I re-engage this car and I suspend the second oldest. And I keep switching cars on and off so I can give six amps to the newest car until a car is fully charged and disconnects or someone drives away and then the system will throttle up again, the charge. But that's the easy way to do, the boring way to do. There is a much more interesting way to do it. We call dynamic load management system. The only difference between the two, we provide eyes to the load management system in the form of energy meter. So the energy meter tells what's going on in the building. And right now, 6 p.m., yes, I only have 100 amps to give it to the charges. But when it comes 3 a.m. in the morning, the LMS will know we can go for full throttle. 
because now we have plenty of capacity available in the building. So the, the way that I show this, it's like that. So imagine this is the typical topology. These are your chargers in the garage in my car park. This is your main distribution board feeding all the loads in the building. So this is everything, apartments, lifts, everything. This is your dedicated EV distribution board feeding the charges. Energy meter monitors the consumption of the whole building. That's load management system. That is an ethernet switch. Cat six cables, ethernet cables connecting all together. So this is a small network. That board can do 400 amps. Right now the building is consuming 150 amps. You do the math, you can spare 250 amps. By the way, magic number 250. Remember the MCC, each board 24 circuits. What's the size of the charges? 32 amps each. 24 times 32 divided by three, three phase, 250. The boards are 250 amp boards are typical boards. So they're not asking for anything special. They're asking for a typical board that can handle 250 amps. So the LMS will receive the information from the meter and say, okay, that's what's happening in the building right now. Let's throttle up to 250 amps. Come 6 a.m. in the morning, people start you know, cooking and doing stuff in the house, in the building. That comes up to 300 amps. We can only spare 100 amps for the charges. Let's throttle down to work with 100 amps. And that's dynamic. That happens across 24 seven. So that's our load management system. Once it's configured, you can open a dashboard on a desktop. That could be the, you know, the, the, the strata, the body corporate. It could be the, uh, the, building, the uh, building manager. They can see what's going on with the whole infrastructure on EV. They can uh, see the, the car park areas. We created the car park areas. You can see the, how many charges are available, how many are charging, how many are suspended, how many are faulted energy consumption per phase. You can see the history of every charging, every transaction. So when I tap my RFID badge, it's me charging. End of the month, they can export the transactions, put on the Excel, okay, this individual consumed this many kilowatt hours, that's your share of the energy bill. Just like that. So pretty simple. Okay, it's not, not hard to configure these things. Uh, my, my observation is it's harder to work this network than actually configure the load management system, making sure each charger has an IP address properly set, everything's connected, that there is no issues with cables and things like that. Once that's all connected, configuring the LMS is quite simple. And that's the secret to putting uh, charges on a brown site. It's installing a dynamic load management system. The other thing that Shinada can offer for infrastructure is what we call bus bar trunking system. So instead of running cable trays across the car park full of you know, cables everywhere, uh, which is much more expensive to, to lay, to put it on, uh, we provided this trunking system, which are sections three meters long, 250 amps rating, and you can just put one next to the other, just plugs like Lego. And uh, every meter or so, there is a little window. If this is my car spot and I buy a Tesla, I call the body corporate and say, that's my car spot, I need the charger. The electrician will come, we'll find the little window that is closest to my car spot, plug in a tap off box. The circuit breaker goes on the tap off box, piece of conduit, charger. So that picks the box off the MCC as well. Can you please switch to the other PowerPoint? So Paula, just quickly, these solutions, so particularly the dynamic load management and the dashboard you get, yep. it's, is it locked into Schneider products in the sense that only Schneider, so if, if a building wants 50 Schneider charges and 25 another, sure. they have to use a separate system for? I'll explain, uh, I'll explain how it works. Charges and LMS, they, they work on an open protocol. It's not Schneider OCP. protocol, OCPP. Yeah. Although, each vendor chooses how it's going to play with OCPP. Okay, so us, Delta, Wallbox, whatever, ABB, each one plays OCPP in a different way. To make a charge and talk to the load management system, you need to test this first. And you need to have a certification that it works. Anyone that says my LMS is vendor agnostic, 
is telling a lie. Because if you ask them, how many charges, how many brains do you talk? Two, three, four. But I bought this extra brain from a website somewhere else in, you know, in the world. Can you make it work? No. It's going to cost me thousands to get the engineers back in the test lab and make it work. So they lock into three or four brains, and that's how it plays. Up to today, Schneider LMS only talks to Evolink, and we can, it's a certified solution. It is in house. There is an issue. You call one number. You have one LMS here, and you have three brands of charges. Something's not working. You're going to see that ball pinging vendor to vendor. You know, now it's not the charges, it's the LMS. Now it's the LMS, it's that charging. You know, it goes like that. By the end of the year, Shinaga will certify three brands of charges that we're going to say you can buy either of these brands or they will link and they will all talk to the load management system. So we are opening, we are opening the architecture. But until today, it's locked into Schneider. Okay. This one here is just to show something else before I, I think I how's my time going? Uh, to show the LMS, the load management system for a single family home. So this is what I was, I was showing to you until now. So this is the commercial offer. So apartments, airports, shopping centers, hotels, they all gonna use this solution. Single family home, my house, that's the solution. What's that about? That's this charger you see over here, that's the home. This charger doesn't need any connectivity, nothing. Needs an electrician to hook the cables in, that's it. The LMS is this tiny box that sits on the distribution board. Comes with a little uh, CT, I call it CT or a current transducer. This is a piece over here. Monitors the consumption of the house. So it goes on the mains of the house. So that's your main uh, switch for the house. You, you just have to push the button to say, my main switch, my main breaker is whatever. My house is 63 amps. Some say I'm, I'm fortunate because you have some units there with 45 amps. So you push the button and say, this house is supplied by a 63 amp mains. It monitors the consumption of the house and whatever is left as a spare, it tells the charger that's your maximum capacity. How it tells the charger to throttle up and down. It sends a signal over the power line. It's a square wave that travels over the power line and finds the charge in the garage. You don't need any CAT6 cables, you don't need anything. People don't realize that that charger becomes the largest load in your property. More than the oven, split system, more than the spa, the pool. It draws 32 amps for hours. It's not just like a 32 amps for a minute and, and low again, it's for hours. How many times we hear the stories about people coming home at 6 p.m. and forget that, uh, you know, the oven is on, the split system is on, the spa is on, they plug the car, trips the breaker. It goes beyond the capacity of the house. So you have to learn next day, okay, coming home 6 p.m., don't plug the car, don't plug the car, don't plug the car, wait until it's 11 p.m. <clears throat> then you plug your car because everything else is off in the house. With the load management system, you can plug at any time. You plug at 6 p.m., might not even charge at all because you don't even have six amps. But then once you start switching off the oven because I finished cooking and now I can spare 10 amps, set point goes into the charger, throttle up to 10 amps. You switch off the split system, it throttle up to 20 amps and so on until it goes up to full charge, likely after midnight. And you don't have to worry about you know, resetting the breaker again. So that's it, the only thing you need, the charger, Secret breaker and the uh, load management system. If you're interested to know the, the cost of this to a wholesaler, eleven hundred dollars, a couple of hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars. To our measure up your solar generation as well, and use that. We don't we don't interface with solar. I was going to say if you're going to use solar, wait until it's nine a.m. and plug your car. Yeah, <laughs> Andrew's had a comment online. Yeah. What's the comment? Uh, I have a 32 socket with a no charger or management, uh, but is on a dedicated three phase circuit separate from the house. Mm. Um, 32 amps, three phase. 
you, you could potentially have a 22 kilowatt uh, charger in there, but what's, um, sorry, what's the question? Is there a question, Andrew? Oh, yeah. oh, just a comment. Okay. <laughs> so is Andrew the only one online? <laughs> so how many have we got online? So the um, got three. EV link. Um, sorry, yes. Um, you say it's all the comms is done over AC. Oh, right. So uh, is, I'm pretty sure is that one compatible with Charge HQ? No, it's not. Not so. so which one? So it's not with CPP. The one that is compatible is with the Charge HQ is the previous family, which uh, is the, the previous Evelink, one. The previous the Evelink smart wall box, yeah. which yeah. was an overkill for the house. Yeah. Because it's a charger designed for commercial applications, also sold for a residential application. So to pay three or four thousand dollars on a charger? Right. Yeah. No. Anyway, we're launching next year uh, a smarter version of this charger for whoever wants integration to their house yeah. automation. Yeah. Because solar, of solar, that's things what like I, that. I, yeah. Someone like me who's got a lot of solar yeah. wants to charge and during the day. That's right. Wants to be able to that's use right. charge HQ or something like that's that right. to, yeah. to control it. So, so that, that charger, that smarter version of this charger, will come early next year. Okay. Can I talk to Gareth O'Reilly and get one too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to me first. <laughs> so we go up to Gareth. Okay. Oh, he's so, my cousin. So. <laughs> Gary <laughs> Proroyal <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is the zone president for Schneider in the Pacific. So he's based in Macquarie Park. In he's worked for Macquarie Park in Sydney. So he's the uh, like, boss's boss's boss. He sounds like his dad's cousin. So, how about is that a seven kilowatt power thing? Or no. can you get it? Uh, we have seven and eleven. Okay. So seven kilowatts a single phase, thirty-two amps, yeah. or eleven kilowatts three phase, sixteen amps per phase. Mm -hmm. One person asked me, "Can I have multiple charges in the same property because of this LMS? Because it doesn't it sends a set point through the power cable. How does it find the right charger? So you can only have one. If you have a single phase single phase home, you can have only one charger." If you have a three phase property, you could potentially have three seven kilowatt charges, one hanging from each phase. And you're gonna have three little load measurement systems, each one sending a set point to a phase to find the car, the garage, the car, the garage. Right, three. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, well, we do. So, do you have um, a three phase version? Oh, no, that's, uh, uh, that's what I said. This is, this is available in 11 three phase, <coughs> seven single phase. This one here, seven single phase or 22 three phase? If you can you hypothetically try to count three EVs and three low band systems, how does it prioritize each of the EV charges <coughs> across all the phases? It's a different LMS. The, the three, okay. You talk about three three charges. So we'll talk about three of these boxes. Yeah. Each one's gonna have a CT hanging from a phase. Yeah. If that phase is consuming more power in the in the house, that charger will throttle down. Yeah, yeah. The others may stay. <coughs> yeah. So you go and switch the times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's going to this is just to show the dynamics of the LMS, but this is what I said already. Um, yeah. And that's how, how it works. Um, charge point operators, they typically plug into these systems through a 4G modem. So the only thing they need to do is bring a modem. We can provide the modem as well. Uh, plug into the switch and the, the CPO like Everty or ChargeFox, they will uh, go through the network and find the charges in there and they're gonna unlock and lock the charges provide the billing platform as you already know. Um, that's how they do it. So they don't throttle the charges up and down. That's the job of the load management system, but they interact with the charges to unlock and lock the charges. Is that like in the flat when the cut to what? Well, well, no, it doesn't lock in the flat. Okay. We, we are moving away from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the previous offer, the Evening Parking had uh, two flaps, is a dual uh, uh, charger. Uh, and the flat locks, so you need to unlock first and then plug the cable. You don't need that anymore. So it's uh, 
Oh, By the way, the home one also has the same color code, so it's green, it's connected, it's uh, charging, so it's oscillating. <coughs> what about locking the cable to the charging? Okay. So we okay. It's locked because once the car is connected to the charger, it's, it's charging, yeah. a pin drops in both car yeah. with charger and locks everything. Yeah. Uh, one thing I can tell you, if the power is off, the pin retracts. You're not locked with the charger. I heard before stories of people trying to drive away, you now the power is off in the building, they can't, they can't disconnect the cable from the charger because the pin remains locked until the power is back. So I've tested. <laughs> I'm testing. No locks. Uh, any questions? Um, quick one. Is there a reason they went with the arch design for the new models compared to the boxy design previously? Uh, water, residual water on top of the charging boxes, or I don't know, what is, or is it just a random? Aesthetics. I, I guess, I guess it's aesthetics. I mean, you can coil the cable around. What's up? So you call it the arch, so yeah. you can't do a square arch, so they had to do that. <laughs> That's right. Well, put it, put it this way, the previous offer had a tiny light on the button. That's there was, you had to be in front of the charger to see what's going on. Yeah. Now you can see from a distance. Uh, you can turn the cable around the charger, so the, you look at the design, uh, you can coil the cable around. Uh, you can bring the conduit from top. And land straight onto the charger so you don't need to bring the conduit over and up again it lands on the charger uh, power comes this way communications that way and the charger hangs from a bracket like this and um, i can open and show how it is inside so if you guys want to that answers it <laughs> uh, but that's that's about it actually that's what i have to share with you guys uh, i hope it's been very good. Very good. Thanks. 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 Silence must be good. We'll take that as a note. Fantastic. All right, Albert, thank you very much. Well, that was very you. informative. Well, and I'm sure that um, there's potential sales sitting right here in this group right now. I don't know what sort of commissions you work.